This is one of those stories where the dog dies in the end. I'm going to tell you about how that dog challenged me to question my own beliefs and to then challenge an entire field immersed in infighting to examine the consequences of a nebulous philosophical boundary and unite instead in solving one of America's most approachable social problems. This is a talk about the no-kill movement, but it's also about how love and social change have overcome impossible obstacles in order to save the lives of millions of pets across America. A couple of years ago, I had the tremendous fortune to meet a dog that we called Jesse. Jesse had these amazing flying nun ears and this crazy coffee brown color, and she was wild and smart and silly, and she was an incredible dog. Jessie was also very unpredictable, and she was a dangerous dog. <clears throat> but before I tell you about all of Jessie's problems, let me first tell you that I fell completely in love with her. She lived at home with my family and I for 18 months as a foster dog. She played with our dogs and tolerated our cats and romped in our yard and slept in our bed, and she was most of the time pretty good in this one environment. But Jessie was dangerous, and despite her truce at home with my animals, she was aggressive toward other animals, and she was prone to threat displays and vocal outbursts, and she would charge at people that she didn't know with her teeth bared and her hackles raised. And because I had pledged myself in the organization I'd worked so hard to build to the no-kill philosophy, I believed that it was both my moral obligation and a possibility to rehabilitate this dog and find her a forever home. I tried everything I could to save her. And we looked everywhere for help. For months, we called shelters and sanctuaries across the country. Those with renowned behavior programs would not offer her a spot there. Those who had sanctuary care told us that dogs who can't get along with others aren't suitable candidates for that type of housing or rehabilitation. So we read hundreds of pages of behavior in training books and we became really good dog trainers. And eventually, after more than a year in our home, Jesse seemed to turn a corner. We didn't know what to credit this success to, so we chalked it up to her possibly having finally acclimated to living in our home, maybe to having just matured out of some of this behavior, or possibly just to have gotten really lucky. But whatever it was, Jesse started to look like a dog that somebody might actually be able to adopt. And then one day, a few months after that, somebody did. But as I've said, this isn't one of those stories about how the no-kill philosophy actually worked for her, and about how an organization and a family who were deeply committed to the idea that every pet can be saved made a miraculous turnaround in a troubled dog and helped her find a happily ever after. Jessie's story doesn't end this way because six months after she was adopted, she turned on the dog in her home and very nearly mauled that dog to death. Understandably hurt and afraid, her family returned her to us. They couldn't bring themselves to take her home with them again. That was the moment where I decided that months ago, I should have made the decision, and I made it then. I took Jessie myself, and I had her put to sleep. And I held her in my arms, and I let her lick my face, and I bid this dog, who I could not save, Goodbye. And in the weeks that followed, my career in animal welfare very nearly came to an end. Not only was the loss of De Jessie and the ultimate finality of her death a soul-crushing experience, but the decision to end her life in this way made me question my own beliefs. The grief that I experienced over killing Jessie was magnified by the fact that in having done so, I had violated my own core values. In her death, K-1 
came the brutal realization that perhaps I was wrong. Did I back myself into a corner by subscribing to an organizational philosophy that had prevented me from seeing the truth of our limitations? Was my judgment over Jesse's care clouded by doubts about what people might think of me or the organization I had worked so hard to build when a dog like her winds up dead in the end? These are some of the questions that led me to identify what I have now come to see as the downfall of the monumentally successful no-kill movement. And I will get to all of the great things it's done here in a minute because there are a lot of them, but there is a dark side to this picture of animal sheltering painted by the movement. It has essentially drawn a line in the sand, and it has forced all of us who care about this cause to choose a side without any care for the consequences of having done so. In its most simplest definition, no kill is achieved by an organization or a community when 90% or more of the animals under the care of that community have a live outcome. Even the movement itself makes room for the death of animals who are sick or injured beyond hope of rehabilitation or who are too vicious to be responsibly adopted to the public. At its face value, this seems pretty straightforward, but in practice, it has proven to not be. And this is because the term that we have used to label this save 90% or more of them effort is in itself misleading. How can you be no kill, but still kill, even if it's 10%? Some will tell you that it's not killing. It's humane euthanasia. It's a relief of suffering, or it's ultimately the very last resort for an animal who cannot be rehabilitated. But you see the problem, don't you? There's still just confusion in these labels. And when you're an average member of the public, or a potential adopter, or a would-be donor, that confusion is leading to a degradation of your perception of our work despite enormous forward progress in recent decades. And even worse, and I have witnessed this many times over, the language of no kill is adversarial and divisive in and amongst progressive, well-run, and influential organizations of all kinds. In essence, the label has forced us to identify as no kill or not and defend ourselves either way. Those at the forefront of the movement have provided us all with numerous and invaluable tools detailing the maintenance, implementation, and success of proven life-saving programs. No-kill groups engage their communities in the prevention of unwanted and homeless pets. They engage them in the adoption of responsible pet ownership practices. They have talented and innovative and compassionate leaders who allow their volunteers and their staff to be continuously inspired and creative in their life-saving efforts. They make euthanasia decisions only with careful consideration to the moral and ethical implications of ending an animal's life. These are just some of the reasons that the movement has been so successful. And it has largely contributed to the fact that 10 million fewer animals are dying in our nation's shelters than were just 25 years ago. 10 million fewer every year. When the first leaders of the no-kill movement began to take a hard look at standard shelter practices and realized all of the ways those things could be improved, it was a radical and transformative investigation of long-standing and acceptable operations. And it brought the issue of homeless pets, previously shrouded in misery and despair, to a new light. It inspired a complete and utter shift in the public's perception of and expectations for animal shelters everywhere. In other words, the no-kill movement was a catalyst for a sweeping social change. It inspired a public that had previously turned a blind eye to the plight of homeless dogs and cats to one that not only insisted those lives be saved, but provided an outpouring of support and resources in order to accomplish it. Programs and services of the no-kill movement that were once anomalies 
are now standard operating procedures across the board. And whether a shelter and its leadership identify with no-kill or not, it's time to recognize that our fundamental principles of modern-day animal sheltering have rendered this label obsolete. At Black Dog Animal Rescue, we work with a lot of animal shelters. And because our rescue doesn't accept pets from the public, we have to partner with those shelters to help them where they need it the most. And I want to talk for a minute about the shelters that we've been working with for the last eight years who are not no-kill. Here's the thing that I've learned along the way about these animal shelters. Their boards and staff and volunteers are dedicated to the guiding principle that every life entrusted to them is precious beyond replacement. These animal shelters are doing everything in their power and within their means to pursue proven life-saving programs. This includes the use of foster homes to increase the capacity of the shelter and to provide respite from the shelter setting. It includes partnerships with other organizations in their communities. They're engaging those same communities in the prevention of unwanted pets and in the adoption of responsible pet ownership practices. They have talented and compassionate leaders. And those leaders are allowing their people the ability to be inspired in their life-saving work. Does that sound familiar? Is it possible that no kill or not, we're actually on the same page? If organizations and the people who serve them have similar fundamental values and are striving toward the same long-term, big-picture goals, then why are we continuing to label ourselves in such a way as to cause confusion and reduce our opportunities for collaboration? Why not instead shift our focus away from euthanasia alone and consider the other factors that will help us decide whether or not we're being effective in our life-saving mission? Because we already know, in fact, that a low euthanasia rate alone is not indicative of an organization's impact. Probably intuitively known to most of us, but now recently demonstrated in 2014 in a presentation to the Society of Animal Welfare Administrators, Dr. Roger Haston utilized a complex mathematical model that showed us that over time, shelters who refuse to euthanize animals at all costs, or with the intent of preserving that 90% or better standard, are likely to drastically diminish in their effectiveness over time. This can be really demonstrated by a very simplistic example. If you have two animal shelters, two large animal shelters, with the capacity to care for 2,000 animals at the same time, and all other things being equal. Animal shelter A strives for a euthanasia rate of 5% or less. Animal shelter B has a euthanasia rate that hovers around 15%. In a year's time, we know that that second animal shelter is going to be able to save some 800 additional pets than the first one. And even if 15% of those animals are euthanized, that second shelter with the higher euthanasia rate is going to save 680 more lives that year. This is because in many shelters and communities, the resources to successfully rehabilitate and find adoptive homes for hard-to-place animals simply do not exist. And as we saw with Jesse, the options to transfer those animals someplace else, those don't exist either. Therefore, the animals experience a prolonged shelter stay. And by, nice, by necessity, they divert valuable resources away from animals who might have a chance at adoption. And what's more, we can assume that because that second shelter isn't always full and its resources aren't always maxed out, it's turning away fewer animals in that community that need their help. Maybe what we thought we knew about saving the most lives possible was wrong. The no-kill movement has brought the problem of homeless companion pets into the national spotlight. It has forever altered 
the expectations of the services and programs provided by our shelters everywhere. And this is why I say that the time has come to recognize that we stand on common ground. We can agree on minimum standards, and we can do everything in our collective power to drive public support to organizations who meet them. We can unite for policies that will make our communities safer for the pets and people, and that will discourage or eliminate cruelty and neglect. We can clearly see there is a large gray area between no kill and not, and we can begin to eliminate the barriers to collaborations and the achievement of our mutual goals as a result. As Jesse showed me, we may not be able to save every homeless pet, but we can save the overwhelming majority of them. And for the sake of achieving our collective vision of a time when there are no more abandoned, abused, neglected, or homeless animals, we must recognize that the time for these labels has come and gone. Let the spirit of the no-kill movement live on in our progress. But the only thing that matters now is our ability to empower each other to move that vision further forward. Thank you.